On the Virginian Railway, nothing was bigger than the Blue Ridge, a million-pound monster that hauled more coal than any other engine on Earth. It was the pride of the mountains, and physics said it was invincible. But when crews tried to start a loaded train up a 1.5% grade, even this titan would snarl, slip, and stall. It could be outmuscled by a force you would not see coming. In the late 1950s, General Electric delivered the ELC, half the length, half the weight, hopelessly ugly, and silent. It looked like a brick, but when they hooked it to the coal drags, it did something impossible. The small electric started trains the steam giants could not budge. The result was humiliation for steam and a new king for the rails. It left one question nobody expected. What makes real power on the railroad? Coal country in southern West Virginia was not a place for half measures. The Virginian Railway carved its way through the mountains with a single mission, move more coal, faster and heavier than anyone else dared. Every day, trains stretched a hundred cars or more, loaded to the brim, pushing 10,000 tons up grades that would make lesser engines weep. The line from Elmore to Roanoke was electrified for a reason. Steam alone could not keep up with the demand. At the heart of this operation stood the Class AG Blue Ridge, an engine that did not just dwarf the competition, it made most locomotives look like toys. Weighing in at 1.2 million pounds, stretching 132 feet from coupler to coupler and boasting 7,500 horsepower, the Blue Ridge was the pride of the property. Its six-foot drivers and articulated frame were built for the brutal work of lifting mountains of coal over the Blue Ridge grades. On paper, nothing could touch it. The numbers were staggering, over a million pounds of steel and fire, capable of hauling the heaviest trains on the continent. Crews called it the proudest iron on the roster. They polished the brass, swapped stories in the shops at Princeton and Mullins, and bragged about the day they made the summit with a single engine, no helpers. For the men who ran her, the Blue Ridge was more than a machine. It was proof that human skill and raw power could conquer the steepest grades and the toughest schedules. Shop culture revolved around these giants. Boiler work, driving rod repairs, and endless rounds of coal and water kept everyone busy. The sound of the Blue Ridge pulling out of the yard, steam hissing, rods clanking, smoke pouring from the stack, was a daily ritual. In the crew rooms, engineers swapped tales of midnight runs and winter storms, of moments when the mountain seemed to push back, but the engine always answered. Pride ran deep, and so did the stakes. If a Blue Ridge stalled, the whole railroad felt it. Every delay meant coal sitting idle, contracts in jeopardy, reputations on the line. Out here, size mattered. The bigger the engine, the bigger the bragging rights. The Blue Ridge was the undisputed heavyweight, a symbol of the Virginians' ambition and the crew's confidence. The idea that anything smaller or quieter could ever replace it seemed like a bad joke. But change was coming, and it would not ask for permission. A loaded coal drag noses onto the grade, and the engineer settles in for the hardest part of the run. The tonnage behind is unforgiving, 10,000 tons of black rock, every car straining the couplers. Ahead, the rails climb at a steady 1.5%, just enough to turn confidence into dread. The Blue Ridge hisses, the fireman feeds the firebox, and the throttle cracks open. Pistons start to push, rods begin to move, and the drivers bite down on steel. But there is a limit written into every mile of track. The factor of adhesion. For steam, it is a hard rule, about four pounds of grip for every pound of weight on the drivers. Push any harder and the wheels break loose. The engineer feels it in his hands. Too much throttle and the six-foot drivers spin, throwing sparks and grinding the rail head to a polish. The sanders kick in, dumping a thin line of grit under the wheels, but it is a patch, not a solution. The mountain does not care about pride or horsepower. It only cares about weight on steel and the laws of friction. The Blue Ridge can boast 216,000 pounds of starting pull in the shop manual, 
but real-world physics cuts that number down. On a damp morning, with rails slick from fog or coal dust, effective tractive effort can drop below 150,000 pounds. The rest is just noise, smoke, thunder, and pounding rods that do not move the train an inch. Every start is a negotiation. The engineer feathers the throttle, coaxing the train to move without crossing that invisible line where grip gives way to slip. The whole train shudders as the slack comes out, coupler by coupler, but the climb is slow and uncertain. Sometimes the drivers grab, sometimes they stutter, and sometimes, despite all the art and all the muscle, the wheels just spin. The cab fills with the sound of labor, metal on metal, steam hammering, the hiss of wasted energy. Pride turns sour, the clock ticks. Dispatches start making calls. Coal sits idle, and every minute lost is money burned. In the shops, they talk about the days when the Blue Ridge made the summit in one shot, but those stories always gloss over the stalls, the helpers called in, the delays that stretched into hours. For all its size, the giant is chained by the physics of steel on steel. The factor of adhesion does not care about reputation, it only cares about the numbers, and on the mountain, those numbers are merciless. The engineer glances at the gauge, hoping for a miracle, but the laws of friction do not bend. The train sits, wheels spinning, couplers groaning, the mountain holding its ground. Out here, brute force is not enough. Something has to give, either the train, the schedule, or the way the railroad thinks about power itself. Crack open the steel cabinet at the center of the ELC and you do not find pistons or fire. Instead, you meet the heart of the machine, a glass and metal cylinder filled with a pool of liquid mercury. This is the Ignitron rectifier, the device that rewrote the rules of railroad power. Overhead, 11,000 volts of alternating current flow down from the catenary. That alternating current is not much use to a traction motor, but the Ignitron changes everything. Here is how it works. Each time the electric current swings positive, a small electrode fires inside the tube. It triggers a violet-blue arc that leaps through the pool of mercury, ionizing the metal and letting current surge through in one direction only. The result is direct current, steady and relentless, ready to be fed straight to the traction motors. There are no moving parts, no rotating generators, no mechanical switches to wear out. Just a controlled lightning strike repeating 60 times a second, bathing the inside of the tube in a ghostly glow. This process is not just efficient, it is instantaneous. As soon as the engineer calls for power, the Ignitron delivers full current to all six traction motors. There is no waiting for steam to build, no pulsing or lag. The direct current flows smooth and strong, letting the motors produce maximum torque from a dead stop. That is the secret weapon. Electric motors can pull at their hardest the moment they are called upon, while steam needs to get moving before it can really dig in. But the Ignitron is not just a marvel, it is a hazard. The mercury inside is toxic. If the arc misfires, a phenomenon called arc back can blow the tube or spill mercury into the locomotive. Maintenance crews had to treat these tubes with the kind of caution usually reserved for hazardous materials teams. Still, for all its danger, the Ignitron gave the ELC the one thing steam could never match. Total control over power right from the first turn of the wheels. October 1956. Twelve new arrivals lined up in the Virginian yard, each painted in a drab coat of grey, each looking more like a rolling shipping container than a locomotive. 69 feet from end to end, weighing in at just under 174 tons, the General Electric ELC did not exactly inspire confidence. Crews who had spent their lives wrangling the Blue Ridge Giants took one look and snorted. Someone called it the toaster before the first run sheet was even filled out. The name stuck. Others called it the brick, and not with affection. Railroaders are a skeptical bunch, especially when their livelihoods depend on the machine at the head end. The ELC did not have the presence of a steam engine. No smoke, no firebox, no polished brass. Just a row of cooling fans, a pair of pantographs, and a face only an accountant could love. 
The old hands in Princeton and Mullins shops joked about needing a magnifying glass to find the horsepower. More than one engineer asked, half serious, if General Electric had forgotten to ship the other half of the locomotive. But the assignment sheets did not care about pride. The dispatchers paired the first ELC with a full coal drag, 10,000 tons headed at the Blue Ridge grade. On paper, that was work for two Blue Ridges or a set of older electrics in tandem. Now, the job fell to a single boxy newcomer. The switchman chalked the numbers on the cab, 130 through 141. 12 units, each with six powered axles and a promise from General Electric that they could do the impossible. The crews rolled their eyes and climbed up anyway. Orders are orders. Out on the main, the jokes kept coming. Do not let it get lost between the rails. If it stalls, maybe we can push. But the ELC did not flinch. It waited, humming, for the signal to pull. The mountain did not care about looks, and neither did the tonnage. All that mattered was what happened next. The cab of the ELC is a study in contrasts. No fire, no drama, just a low hum and a bank of dials. The engineer glances at the amateur, hand steady on the controller. 10,000 tons of coal stretch out behind, the same load that left steam crews sweating bullets. The dispatcher voice crackles over the radio, clear to attack the grade. The controller is not feathered or coaxed. It is advanced in one smooth motion. Instantly, the amateur needle jumps, pegged deep into territory that would make a steam fireman flinch. The six traction motors answer together, pouring maximum torque into the rails before the wheels even turn. There is no slip, no jolt, just a deepening hum as the couplers stretch, car by car, the slack vanishing down the train like a zipper. The mountain tries to hold back, but the ELC does not care. The engineer feels the weight, but not the struggle. There is no frantic sanding, no wheel spin, no clouds of wasted steam, just traction. The train moves as one, every axle biting into the steel. The speedometer rises past 10, then 20, then 30 miles per hour on a 1.5% grade that cut the Blue Ridge down to 15 on its best day. The amateur stays high, the current steady, the power relentless. Where steam would have faltered, the ELC simply walks away. The mountain does not get a say. In the rear cars, the slack comes out so gently that coffee barely ripples in a brakeman's cup. The only sound is the drone of fans and the faint thrum of electricity. The engineer checks his gauges, almost bored. The train is moving and nothing is fighting back. There is no drama, just business. The dispatcher notes the time. The ELC is making the climb faster than any double-headed steam consist ever managed. The numbers are right there in the logs, 30 miles per hour, 10,000 tons, a single electric locomotive. In the shops, heads turn. The old hands who once bet against the brick are silent. The proof is in the numbers, and the numbers do not lie. The ELC has done what the giants could not. No slip, no stall, no wasted motion. Just pure, unbroken pull all the way to the summit. Management wasn't sentimental. The numbers from the first ELC runs hit the boardroom like a cold wind where the Blue Ridge demanded armies of shopmen, endless fuel, and constant repairs, the electric fleet simply kept moving coal. The old equation, bigger engine, bigger results, no longer applied. The ELC delivered more tonnage per dollar, per hour, and per man. Within months, the Class AG engines were lined up for scrap, some barely a decade old. The Blue Ridge, once the pride of the Virginian, became a memory its brass plates pried off as souvenirs, its hulk cut down for steel. Steam's reign ended not with a grand send-off, but with a quiet memo and a one-way ticket to the torch. The ELC units, meanwhile, had barely broken in their bearings. When Norfolk and Weston absorbed the Virginian in 1959, they saw no reason to keep a parallel electrified system. By 1962, the wires came down, but the ELC units were still too valuable to let go. In 1963, nearly new, they were sold to the New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad. Their numbers repainted, 
their routes shifted from Appalachian coal to New England freight. The same 12 units, now called EF4 units, hauled freight through Penn Central's chaos, rolled on under Conrail, and even wore Amtrak stripes into the early 1980s. These were not museum pieces, they were tools, working day after day, long after the steam giants had vanished from the rails. It's easy to fall for the romance of steam, the spectacle, the sound, the sense of power. But the railroad is a business. The ELC proved that progress isn't always beautiful, and it doesn't ask for applause. The fleet's survival wasn't about nostalgia or fame, it was about results. A boxy, grey electric engine outlasted five railroads, moved more tonnage, and outlived the legends it replaced. In the end, the lesson was simple. The future belongs to what works, not what wows. The ELC didn't just kill the steam age, it buried the idea that size and spectacle matter more than efficiency. That's the verdict written not in headlines, but in the ledgers and the scrapyards. Today, efficiency, not spectacle, moves the world's freight. The ELC's silent talk rewrote the rules, proving that raw size means nothing without precision. As global logistics push for cleaner, smarter power, the lesson endures. True progress favors the quietly relentless over the gloriously obsolete. In an era chasing sustainability, it is not the loudest machine that leads, it is the one that simply gets the job done. What do you think deserves the spotlight next?